Please rise for the gospel verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. <clears throat> Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go hence. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the revealing of your love through the gift of your Son, for his willingness to go to the cross in our place, for that Lamb who takes away our sin even this day. We thank you also for the gift of your Holy Spirit that has come within us, that has empowered us to gather here this day and to receive the gifts that you provide your people, word and sacrament. We pray that you would guide us by that spirit now. Turn our hearts and minds from the kingdoms and the ways of the world to your kingdom and your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So did you check your numbers? An Omega Million one? Did, did you check that? It, you do know how much money was given out with the Mega Million Award, right? One half billion dollars. Now, I, I didn't write down the numbers because you didn't win. There, there was only one guy. He won. And I would never suggest that anybody buy any lottery tickets. Uh, you know, somewhere between 30 and 70% of the people who actually win end up in bankruptcy. Never in bankruptcy before, but... It's a challenge. But you know how it's based. Uh, you know, it's all a matter of odds. You know what the odds were of winning that, uh, that number, that amount? One in 302 million. So I guess if you spend, a, I don't know how much it costs. Is it a dollar probably? So a, a dollar, 302 different numbers. Maybe you'd hit it and make a couple of dollars, but... A, of course, you'd need the 302 million to start with. I'm not sure that's a practical way to do it. But it's all about odds. We, we would say, we're not even going to do it. We're smart enough to know there's no chance of that happening. And my question for the day is, what chance is there that the faith could have been passed on to the first generation after the disciples? What kind of odds? If there were a Las Vegas in those days, what kind of odds would they have given that this faith could have made it out of Palestine, that it could have been anywhere close to what Jesus, probably in hyperbole, was talking about all nations. You know, everybody is going to find salvation through me. What are the chances? Especially when 10 days ago, he left. We remember he left on ascension. I, I, I missed 
preaching last week on ascension, so let me just make one comment. As I did the study, I really looked for it, and we've got some other pastors hanging around. Maybe they'll correct me on this. Um, but it seemed to me that that event was a surprise to the disciples. I mean, I looked in all the Gospels, I tried to search it out, and, and Jesus had been meeting periodically with his disciples, explaining, teaching, repeating some of those parables, perhaps, because now it made more sense. Now he was raised from the dead. So when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, when he says, if you believe in me, you will never die, there's some power to back it up. But that particular day, he said, let's go out to the hillside. He didn't say, listen, I'm taking off today, you know, so uh, just come. You don't want to miss this. Yeah. He, he went there. He went before with his disciples to private places to pray with them, to teach them, to pray to God. I mean, there could have been a lot of things expected, but the one where he just levitated, where, where he, he, he disappeared into a cloud, as far as I can tell, the disciples would have, would have, you know, like it's described, stood there with their mouths open. Oh, men of Galilee, why do you stand there with your mouths open? You've got something that needs to come out of those mouths. And, and that's what Jesus described. He had completed his mission. He was sent by the Father. He, he, he listened to what was called for, and he went to the cross, and he died, and the Father raised him from the dead, and he was finished. So now, tag, you're it. Your turn. So what odds would the disciples have taken? When he disappears and they're there, what expectation would they have that what Jesus described was by any means possible in any kind of odds? I mean, if you think about those disciples and, and, and some of their words, I, I wonder if you can remember them uh, with me, uh, comes to mind, you tell me who said it. Um, you know, it seemed like an idle tale. This could be a bad experience for me. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, and we're talking right around the time of the resurrection, uh, you know. Anyway, the women, let me give you a little more. I'm, I'm going to stop this in a second. Uh, a hint uh, is that it is the women who come and say something to the disciples. He is risen. He is risen indeed. They, they didn't say he is risen indeed. That's a great liturgical thing that developed in a little bit. Uh, but at the time, they go, <laughs> the women. I, I'm just telling you. It seemed like an idle tale. The, the context for these phrases um, is really the Matthew 28, Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them everything I commanded to you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. See you later. And he leaves. And their responsibility for people to call on the name of the Lord Jesus, to know him and trust him for salvation, is on the disciples. I, I wonder how they felt about that responsibility. Especially when they, they don't even quite believe. Well, an idle tale. Could it really be true? Is that possible? Fear. I, I, I mean, they didn't have so much fear when Jesus was around, but now he's gone. There's a lot to be afraid of. You remember where they spent the Easter day? They were in a room, an upper room, and the door was locked for fear of the Jews. They're going to go to the nations and tell everybody about Jesus, but they are afraid to go out of the house. At this point, we know they are all together in one place on Pentecost, 50 days later. They hear there will be power, but they don't know what that power is. They had not experienced it. Jesus didn't describe it. Well, it's going to be like this. There'll be fire on top of your head. There'll be wind in a room. He just, there's going to be power from on high. Whatever that means. Day after day, they waited. These disciples are struggling. They have their doubts. They have fear. 
They have commitment. At least they got that. I mean, that is the way they were called. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Jesus is crucified. Jesus is raised. Peter says, in the midst of his great commitment to this risen Lord Jesus, what, remember what he said? I'm going. I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. There's commitment at the top of the game, you know. Peter the bold one. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'm going fishing. The disciples correct him by saying, we'll go with you. <laughs> we got nothing to do. I mean, Jesus isn't here all the time. Why not? And then the question is asked to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Are you going to just do fish or fish for men? The disciples are struggling with this. But at least they, they heard and they knew and they were committed to the center of all. That Christ came in order to bring forgiveness to everyone. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the Palestinian. No, the sin of the disciple. No, um, the world. I'm talking grandiose here. At least they knew that, right? So they didn't have any problem with this forgiveness thing. I mean, I mean, it was a question of the limits, you know. I got to do this seven times? <laughs> Are you kidding? Se seven? Even in the same day? Uh, I mean, even in the same day, we, we, we can do that. Sure. They're on their way to Jerusalem, and they pass through Samaria, and they come to a town, and those people, they wouldn't accept, they wouldn't welcome him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. You remember the love of those disciples? Remember what he said? Shall we pray fire to come down from heaven and destroy them? Huh? Believe or die? It was like the Inquisition. Heck of an evangelism program. You got to say. Yeah. Thank you for those who know the Inquisition. Anyway, read about it at home. So these are the ones who have the mission. They're the ones with the responsibility. Who's going to save? I mean, that persists. Because this isn't just their problem, it's our problem. Our commitment. I mean, you said, you know, I was just listening. Well, no, I said it along with me. I have not committed my whole heart or my soul or my life to you. I have not loved you that way. A little like now and then. But... My whole self? To lose my life? Is there anybody? Well, I don't want to have you raise your hand. It would embarrass the rest of us who are not that committed to the faith or not that ready to forgive. Uh, I, personally, I can explain why my sin, we could talk later privately, I, I can explain why my sin is working on me. But these people I see on the news, these other people, boy, I'll tell you, God must have a tough time forgiving them. Here we are thousands of years later with the same sin within us, divided and struggling to live faithfully the faith that God has given us. Who saves? There it is. After all the preparation, disciples are gathered around. They're praying with Jesus and the garden says, it's getting time to go. And Peter says, it's okay. I've got two. It's the last one. Somebody... <laughs> Swords! I got two swords. I can do it. Here's the young man. What must I do? Can you just tell me? How do I pull myself up by my own bootstraps? How do I save myself? What must I do to inherit eternal life? What's the law? Have you done all of that? You can't? You can't do it all? Just one more thing. You're in love with that stuff that's passing away? Sin is going to get you in one or the other. So the disciples are the ones left with the assignment to go and make disciples of all nations. But that day, that day of Pentecost, no different than any other day other than they were Jewish and it was the festival. There was a festival going on in Jerusalem a Jewish festival that brought a lot of people into town. Anybody remember what the name of that was? <laughs> Who said that? Was that Q up there? 
Yeah, well, all right. Well, last night. That, uh, okay, little asterisk by that right answer. Did you? I missed it last night. Sorry. Uh-huh. Pentecost. It was a Jewish festival. We, we relate it to what God did with Christians, but it was a Jewish festival. There were three. There were three pilgrimage festivals for the Jews. Three times a year where if you were a healthy male, no matter where you were, you were supposed to go to Jerusalem and offer a sacrifice. Is that odd? I mean, it's since the beginning of time, Joel's promise there from God that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out my spirit on all people, on little kids and old guys about to die and women and maid service. God. It's going to be on everybody. That spirit is going to fill people. Boy, that's going to be great. Of all the days to do it, happened just so coincidentally to be on the day when all these Jews from all over the world are there. And it is such a raucous event. Wind inside the room. You know about wind. I, I, the, the, the blessing that we have as pastors is learning a little Greek, some of which we remember even into our later years. The wind is the same word for spirit. So there is this wicked spirit in the room. There is this wind whipping in the room. It is the second breath. A- anybody work in a hospital? A- anybody work in a hospital? Ever? Okay. Did you ever pull somebody back who was dead? Do code blue on them? Did you, anybody ever do that? I, I actually, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. The emergency room doctor. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, uh, Anyway, is it not, this is Dr. Dr. West there, is it not extraordinary when when it starts again, the heart starts and the breath? (gasps) The opposite of the death rattle, when when uh, the muscles contract. There are these disciples, weaker than puppies, unable to do the mission. But he said, wait, wait until power from on high comes upon you. And the wind fills the room and fills them. It's a second creation. It's a second birth. Reborn children of God. That's what we talk about. I I know it's not our Lutheran language, but it's the truth. This body is falling apart. The second birth we got is without end. Those disciples are filled. They are breathed into. They receive CPR. They are resuscitated. They are given a new life. And tongues of fire distributed on each one of them. They are glowing like little transfigured people. Like a burning bush. They're on fire. And they go outside. And there's so much noise. All these people gather around and say, these guys are drunk. It's only the third hour of the day. Anybody know what time that is? 9 (laughs) a.m. They might have been drunk by 3. But at 9, it's not the case. They may well be because this is a heck of a day. And so they're filled with that spirit. and, And so they start to proclaim. Now, that's an odd Old Testament lesson. Would you, would you agree? I mean, what has that got to do with Pentecost? It's like the mirror image, Pentecost. Here it is, sin that divides people to protect them. We're not going to have Lex Luthor uh, on uh, Superman. You know, we can't have just one. We're going to divide it. That's going to be your protection from the sin that works in you. But now, these people here, in their own languages... The mighty works of God. Well, who did that? Some of the rabbis, some of the temple leaders, trained theologians. I mean, they started to preach. I mean, there should be rules about this. I think there are rules now. We got the assistant that a bishop, we get dullest. I mean, if you don't have homiletics, can you get on that pulpit? And say, I guess you can't. <laughs> Shouldn't. So here's these fishermen suddenly are talking about the mighty acts of God in Jesus Christ. The ones who were in the locked room. The ones who have come out now on Pentecost to share the good news about Jesus. Oh. It was not glossolalia. 
You, you know glossolalia, speaking in tongues, a language that other people cannot understand, even the speaker cannot, unless he has a gift of interpretation of tongues. This is a fisherman from Galilee speaking the language of the hearer. How in the world are you going to get to all nations? I mean, what kind of a budget would be needed evangelism-wise? How, how, how is this even possible? This is foolishness, especially with us. But there God does Pentecost. God has the power. It's his mission which he gives to us. And so we are sent out, and he provides the words. Now, you know, we could ask the pastors how many conversions you've had. I know, our Lutheran tradition, not exactly an altar call, though I did have somebody who did that. It's funny. We got a minute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're doing new members, and so I said, those that are joining, come forward. Normally, I say their names. You know, Mary Lou, Bob, you know, Fred, Ted, like this. This time, if you were here, I didn't say the names because I had no clue who that lady was who came forward. You know what she heard? An altar call. I said, are you ready? Are you ready to join this movement? And she came forward. I don't watch the child. She was a reporter for, for a television station. I'm embarrassed that I didn't. I don't watch that show. But anyway, she came forward. And she took a cross and put it over on the banner. And when she came back, I tried to hand her a key, and she goes, Oh, no, I didn't know I was joining the church. <laughs> Spirit does amazing things. If we could just believe that really the mission is his, and the way it gets passed on is through us today. No Peter, no Thomas, no Paul, just us, limited as we are incapable due to our sin and everything else unless, unless God was going to have his power move through us. So when we were baptized into Christ Jesus, into his death, so that we might live a new life, we received that spirit. Same spirit. Oh, it was gentle because we were that little one, most of us. And it was very gentle but that spirit's been at work. You know that. I know that. We wouldn't be here if that spirit weren't at work, if you're ever wondering about whether he's there. No one can say Jesus is Lord without that spirit. All right, Lutherans, let's all say it together. Third article of the Creed. I'll sign off on your confirmation renewal papers. I believe that I cannot believe by my own reason or strength. But the Holy Spirit has called me and sent me to call others. Disciples make disciples. So it is a fearful and awesome thing for a Lutheran to do it. You do it once. It's like, can you remember, doctor, your first restoration where he came back? Yeah. Once that happens, you, you be, at least with me, I had an expectation everybody I did that to was coming back, and that's not always the case. But it doesn't matter. You've got to try. And so, so we have the opportunity, fed with word and sacrament, blessed with a powerful spirit, to make witness in the world and to speak to someone. To start simply and say, hey, where are you going for Easter service? Oh, I haven't been to church in years. I don't know. What do you think the spirit would lead you to say? <laughs> Want to come with me? It's not hard. That power of the Spirit. And, and then oddly enough, last thing, oddly enough it says, you know, Jesus says, I want you to go and make disciples, teaching them to, what's the next word? Observe. Why didn't he just say, teach them the Bible? Teach them some of the words. Teach them the stories. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. How could they see it? Buy a Bible, read the words. Is that, why didn't you just say do that? What is that observation? You see, there is this gift of the Spirit that comes. These fruit of the Spirit. Not our gifts that we created, but God's gift to us. Love, divine, joy, even at a time of death, because we know the resurrection is coming. 
peace, not like the world's giving, but God gives. Patience, were you waiting for that? Patience, because we know Kairos time, God's time, not Kronos, what time it is on the watch. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. The Spirit's been at work in our lives, and we get to do that. Everybody with their gift, and so we're still looking for it. Three of you are shepherds, little shepherds. Never went to seminary. Want to be a shepherd? You just lead this little group of children from one class to the next. We, we have three openings left for VBS here, starting tomorrow. And you get to be the witness, to smile patiently at a little four- or five-year-old, to lead them from class to class. Because there'll be a day we cannot make the witness. It'll be their turn. So we do it now. We've been blessed with kids being sent. I pray you can be part of that. So Jesus promised, oddly enough, as he's leaving, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Here in this place where two or three have gathered, where the word is proclaimed and the meal is broken, Christ is present with us. May he strengthen us in our witness. This day, in Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.